Hello everybody and welcome to the final audiobook for Friendly Face. This is the epilogue and apparently I've heard a lot about this epilogue. I haven't heard any spoilers or anything but I've heard that this is the epilogue. There are reveals in this, there are good things in this, there are bad things in this and all around this epilogue is apparently one of the best. So I cannot wait to read what is going to be in this. I have no idea what's coming. So, um, oh, I'm so excited. This is what I've been excited for. Um, I, I wasn't excited for the other stories, even though they turned out to be amazing. I was excited for this. So, we're going to see if we're going to get somewhat of an ending to this Stitch Raid story in the next book. Anyway, let's get straight into this. Larson leaned over his desk, frowning at his computer screen. He hated following paper trails, or more accurately, electronic trails. All the forms being trapped behind his desk for days at a time. It was his least favourite part of police work. He preferred being out in the field, talking to witnesses, and chasing down suspects. For, but for all his annoyance, this kind of investigating was important too. For days now, he'd been trying to trace the history of the building where he'd found the bull pit, but he'd landed in a quagmire of real estate transactions and business permits. The building had been the home of so many failed ventures that trying to follow the transfers was making Larson's eyes burn. This wasn't his forte. Larson sat back and rubbed his itchy eyes. The addresses and phone numbers were all blurring together. Opening his eyes, his gaze landed on Chansey, who was strolling toward the coffee machine. Larson wasn't crazy about Chansey, but Chansey was the only other detective in the bullpen right now. Roberts and Powell were both testifying in court this afternoon, and the other detectives were out for a coffee break. At least the absence of Roberts and Powell meant the bullet pen, or the bullet pen? The bullpen smelled better than usual. The only odour Larson noticed came from the bitter dregs in the coffee maker. Hey Chansey, Larson called out. Chansey turned grinned and sauntered back toward Larson. What's up? he asked. Larson waved him over. He pointed out his computer screen. You're only good at tracing ownership of real estate. I found a trail so convoluted I cannot make heads nor tails of it. Chansey pulled up a chair next to Larson's desk. The chair legs scraped across the floor. Larson got a whiff of spicy cologne. Sure thing, Chansey said. That's as easy as apple pie. Larson raised an eyebrow. Um, okay. He pointed at his screen again. What do you make of this? Chansey scanned the screen, then reached for Larson's keyboard. Mind? Larson waved his okay. Chansey took over the keyboard and typed at a, blasti uh, a blast blazing fast speed for several minutes. More addresses and phone numbers flashed across the screen. Larson felt a headache coming on. Finally, Chansey leaned back. He shook his head. This place has had more names and owners than a stray dog has fleas. Larson frowned. But who owns it now? Chansey gestured at the screen. Well, there, that's... Well, that there's where we get thrown off the bull. I can't figure that out from just a quick dive. Larson studied Chansey. The cowboy persona was annoying, but the man wasn't stupid. Think you could, uh... You think, think you could if you spend some time on it? I'd sure give it my best shot, Chansey said. Larson handed Chansey part of the bull pit file. He kept back the lab results and added those to a stack of files he'd pulled a couple of hours before. Go for it, Larson said. Chansey took the file and grinned. Then he moseyed away to get the coffee he'd, seen, he'd been after in the first place. Larson looked around to make sure no one had come to, into the bullpen to see what he was working on. He was still alone. Taking out a yellow legal pad, he opened the lab report and the top file in the stack he'd created, then got to work. It took Larson an hour to finish his lists. By this time, a couple of detectives were back, but they weren't paying Larson any attention. Larson put down his pen and studied the pages in front of him. Earlier that morning, he had started cross-checking the dates associated with the blood samples uh, against dates of other crimes. He was hoping to link the blood samples to unsolved murders. That didn't happen, but he had linked them to something. It turned out that the blood sample dates coincided with bizarre incidents, ranging from missing persons 
to almost every other kind of strange phenomena imaginable. In more than one incident, parents reported that their teens had found a strange robot-like body, like a metal mannequin, not long before the teens disappeared. Larson skimmed all these statements. At first he was tempted, like the detectives who had taken the statements, to dismiss the reports as the confused ramblings of freaked out parents. But the details the parents gave were too similar. The body looked female, with a pale, gaunt face decorated with crude clown makeup. Is this Eleanor? Is this Eleanor? I don't know. It, it, I might be getting the wrong end of the stick. Or it could be the puppet? No, 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 no. I don't know. Now that Larson had made his lists, he could see that a teenager had gone missing during several time, uh, several of the time periods associated with the blood samples Larson had taken. Not every teen was associated with the metal mannequin, but every teen's disappearance did happen on a date listed on the ball pit blood sample list. What did that mean? The blood couldn't belong to the teens, because it was the same blood each time. Who did it belong to? Larson pushed aside his lists and started flipping through the files again. He went through photo after photo of happy or sullen-faced teens. They didn't reveal anything that he... Wait a second. Larson went back to a photo he just turned over. He dug in his drawer for a magnifying glass. Holding the glass over the photo, he looked past the shoulder of one of the missing girls. And there it was behind her. The metal mannequin with the clown face. It was real. And now... Larson knew what it looked like. Larson examined the metal mannequin carefully. Its face was skeletal, as though the thinnest layer of deceased grey skin had been stretched over its skull. The skin was painted ga garishly with a candy apple red mouth and pink circles on the cheeks, giving it the hideous clown-like appearance some of the parents had mentioned. Its large, deep-set eyes were dark pits, and its red painted mouth was stretched wide, revealing a mouthful of large, jagged teeth. So it's Eleanor, right? I, w I think it's Eleanor. Uh, Larson couldn't tell if it was smiling or baring its teeth in aggression. The thing's sparse red hair was pulled into, tw into twin pigtails on top of its head, a bizarrely childish hairstyle for something so hideous. The whole thing gave Larson the creeps. So did the weird cartoonish heart pendant hanging around its neck. There we go. He wasn't sure why the heart gave him the heebie-jeebies, but it did. So hang on a second. Let's just pause there. Because that's useful information. So not only w in To Be Beautiful, we see one of these incidents, right? Of the girl turning into metal and then Eleanor running away with Sarah's body. We see that incident happen, Okay. But that's only one of the incidents. There have been so many incidents with this clown girl in common, and it's been over the course of 30 years? Huh. Am I right in saying that? I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm right in saying what I'm saying, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Larson quickly went back through the files again, noticing something he'd missed before. He flipped back and forth through the reports. Finally, he picked up his pen and jotted a note on the bottom of his lists. Now he had something else too, a name. Although most of the incidents were seemingly unrelated from a glance, someone must have investigated their connection at one point, because an expert of some sort had been called in on more than one occasion. A Dr. Talbert! Wait, what story is Talbert from? Isn't that... Is, not, is that not from... Um, is that not from... Uh, the story that we literally just read, Together Forever. I'm sorry I have to do this, but... Talbert. Let's search. Uh, no. Where's Talbert from? I have to find out now. Okay. Let me just... I am really sorry that I have to pause here, but we have to go through this slowly. Because there is a lot to take in here. So, uh, Fazbeth writes... Dr. Talbert. I swear he's from a story. Is he from the epilogues? Just the epilogues? Uh, uh, no, I, I, I don't think we've seen Talbert. Oh, huh, that's weird. It seems like a, a, a name. Like I, like, 
a name that I should recognise. Anyway, he apparently specialised in a mysterious material called... <gasps> called Remnant. What? Oh my god! Oh my god. Okay, okay. This is crazy. Remnant, according to the investigator who's seen it, looked like bubbling liquid mercury. We know what Remnant is, but no one knew what it did. No one had been able to get their hands on a sample of it, so it had never been analysed. Remnant is a bubbling liquid mercury? Okay. Okay, that's, that's cool. I love that. That's very cool. How did all this fit together? And what did it have to do with the Stitch Wraith? Larson didn't know. The ball pit might have been visiting him in his visions, but it didn't seem to be leading him to any answers, or at least not any answers that made sense. Larson's only choice was to locate the Stitch Wraith. The Stitch Wraith was at the heart of everything, no pun intended. Maybe Larson would get his answers when he found it. Okay, this is interesting. It had taken Jake several days, but he'd finally done it, or at least he thought so. He was pretty sure he'd found Rennell's father. While he nursed Rennell back to health, Jake had coaxed as much detail from her as he could about her father and where she'd lived. It had been tricky because he didn't want her to know what he was doing. He was pretty sure she'd resist any idea of going home. She clearly missed her dad, but she tensed up every time Jake mentioned him. For those of you who don't know, Rennell backwards is Eleanor, so we assume that this is Eleanor. Um, anyway, Jake had tried to get the information by touching Rennell, hoping to see her memories like he had seen those of the man behind the dumpster. Unfortunately, probably because of her history with drugs, Rennell's memories were disjointed and unclear. They seemed as off-base to him as Rennell's name still felt. He continued to sense that Rennell had another name, but he hadn't asked her about it. All in all, nothing that Jake had gotten from Rennell had given him clu any clues about where her dad lived. And because Rennell's memories were jumbled, Jake hadn't been able to use them to soothe her. He hadn't been able to pick a nice one and make a bubble from it like he had for the homeless man. Even so, Rennell was much better. The food Jake had managed to get for her had worked magic. You're quiet tonight, Rennell said. It was late evening. The sun had been down for just an hour or so. The night outside the shed's window was clear. A nearly full moon cast a gleaming beam of pale yellow light into the shed. Rennell had just finished a can of fruit cocktail and was braiding her hair into pigtails. Even though she hadn't been able to wash it, it still looked pretty to Jake. I have something to tell you, Jake said, but I'm not sure if you're going to be happy with me. Rennell laughed. You've been nicer to me than anyone else since my mum died. Why wouldn't I be happy with you? Jake decided it was time. I want to take you home, he said. He braced himself for her reaction. Rennell tilted her head and studied Jake. Her expression didn't change. She just shrugged and said, Okay. Well, that was easier than he thought it would be. Oh, Jake said. Rennell laughed again but blinked, as if holding back tears. When? For a second, Jake was flustered, but then he understood. How about now? Rennell nodded, stood, and took his metal hand. Jake pushed the door open, and together they left the shed and headed toward the railroad tracks. Rennell's home was on the outskirts of town and the tracks led to the street her dad lived on. It didn't take Jake and Rennell long to walk from the shed to the right street. Rennell had more strength in her legs than Jake expected. They were walking through an area that was more rural than urban. Its houses were mostly single storey and sprawling. Jake thought the style of homes here was called contemporary. He decided it wasn't something he liked. Somehow the homes didn't look very inviting. They weren't cosy and warm like the small house he'd grown up in. When they, left, when they first left the tracks, Rennell had followed Jake as if she didn't know where they were going. But now Rennell's steps were growing surer. Jake wondered why he'd worked so hard to figure out where her dad was. He could have just asked Rennell where she lived. She seemed to have no resistance to returning home, at least not until they reached the house. Rennell's dad lived in a white house that looked like a collection of child's building blocks. It was even more harsh looking than the other modern houses in the area. The various chunks of the house had big windows, all covered with shades. Light filtered through the shades, illuminating a mostly concrete and rockyard front. Uninviting, Jake thought. When Rennell's footsteps faltered on the home's front porch, Jake took her hand. It's okay, I'll make sure he's not mean to you. Rennell looked up at Jake. She smiled. 
He rang the doorbell. As soon as the doorbell chimed, the, door, the front door unlatched and swung open. Well, that was weird, Jake thought. Put it in a foyer, a deep male voice called out. I'll be right there. Jake looked at Ronelle. She seemed to have gotten her nerve back. She stepped into the house as she stared. Dad must get a lot of deliveries. Jake followed Ronelle through the door, and he stopped as soon as he was inside. The house was more welcoming on the inside. The sofa in the living room was a soothing soft green and piled with comfortable looking throw pillows. The coffee table was stacked with magazines and there was a cosy armchair with a floor lamp next to it. It looked like an excellent place to curl up and read. Interesting. In... Is that... Hmm. I'm just thinking of like Midnight Motorist and the sister location uh, TV thingy. I, I, I don't think it's anything, actually. No, it, it, there's no TV there. It didn't even mention a TV. What am I talking about? While Jake looked around, Ronelle walked through the room as though it were an art gallery. She seemed happy to be home. Jake ga uh, gazed past her and saw a wall of photographs. He took a step toward it. The first photo he spotted was one of two men, both wearing lab coats. One had a long, craggy face and greying, bushy black hair. The other had a round face and short grey hair. Jake knew the second man. Huh. Jake knew the second man. The one with short grey... Is it... Huh. Is it Phineas? Is it Dr Phineas? Huh. He had put together the endoskeleton that Jake was in. Oh, right. It was Phineas, yeah. I, I, sorry, I just did not read, uh, Phineas Taggart. Was that the name, by the way? Taggart? Oh no, it was Talbert. Sorry, I, I'm really slow today. I, I've read a lot in the past few days. <laughs> in the weeks since Jake had found himself in his metal body, he discovered that the man's name was Dr. Phineas Taggart. Ronell's dad was Taggart's friend? Oh, okay, Jake, wait! So is Taggart a William parallel? And... No, wait, no, never mind. <laughs> Jake continued to examine the photos on the wall. Then he spied something that would, sm that would have made his stomach churn, if he had had one. In one of the photos, Dr. Talbert was smiling happily with a preteen girl. The girl had curly black hair and dark brown eyes. She looked just like Dr. Talbert, her dad. But wait, Jake thought. Looking back and forth between the photo and the girl standing in front of it. Ronelle doesn't have curly black hair or dark brown eyes. She doesn't look anything at all like the girl in the picture. Ooh. Ooh, so is Ronelle a faker? Ronelle's a faker. This is really interesting. Larson parked on the street in front of the strange blocky house. Chancy the corn pone cowboy might be annoying, but he was amazing at research. Larson walked across the concrete front yard. He guessed it saved time on mowing and found the front door standing open. It seemed like an invitation. He stepped into the foyer and stood frozen, unable to believe what was in front of him. There was the familiar white face with sunken black eyes, the endoskeleton body, the stitch wraith. Standing next to it was a young girl with unwashed hair braided into pigtails. Her clothes were worn and dirty, but she was otherwise... Uh, she was otherwise seemed normal. But what happened next was anything but normal. The girl was staring at a photo of a younger girl, a pre-teen with curly black hair. And then suddenly, she was that girl. Small, black-haired, adorable, and innocent looking. Innocent looking, but not innocent. Larson felt his insides turn to jelly. It was happening. Another one of his visions. He felt himself sinking into it, quicksand-like. He was unable to lift himself out, no matter how badly he wanted to. As he stared at the newly transformed girl, the mask she had created for herself fell away. He no longer saw the smiling face of a curly-haired child, but another face that was all too familiar. The sickly skull-like shape, the painted pink circle cheeks, the red mouth with its twisted teeth, the heart-shaped pendant which appeared to pulse and throb. It was her from the picture. The clown peeking over the disappeared girl's shoulder. Out of nowhere, a name popped into his head. Eleanor. <laughs> he, 
He could see her, but he could see into her too. And what he saw was a black chaotic force that fed on human suffering. The fear, the pain, the death. She, not the stitch wraith, was the cause of it. In both his head and his heart, Larson knew this to be true. He was surer of it than he had been of anything in his life. He was also sure that he drew his gun and took aim. The girl's eyes met his. She smiled. The room fell away, as did everything familiar. Larson's eyelids fluttered, then shut, and he fell to the floor with a thud. Eleanor, he whispered before he lost consciousness. What? Ah! <laughs> no, Larson is dead. Larson can't be dead. Dead. Okay. It was dark, but there was an eerie glow, as if a neon, si uh, a neon sign were shining from outside a window. But there were no windows. There was nothing. A void. Larson blinked hard, trying to adjust his eyesight. Then he saw her just a few feet ahead of him. She was standing in front of a table. Her back was turned, but her identity was unmistakable. Her, the red pink tails, the long neck, the curves of the robotic body. He stepped closer. She was working on something so intently she didn't seem to notice him behind her. He drew nearer. The object that was taking up all her attention was a hideous plush toy. Its long ears uh, suggested it was a rabbit. Though it was certainly the least cute stuffed bunny Larson had ever seen. And what in the world was she doing with it? With one hand, she held its jaws open wider than seemed possible. With the other, she was shoving something into its mouth. Something that made an unpleasant squishy sound as she pressed it down. What is going on? <laughs> Stepping a bit closer, Larson saw it was a tooth. One in a row of bloody human teeth that occupied the thing's lower jaw. It, wait, Larson saw it was a tooth. What, is in like the tooth from He Told Me Everything? No, I'm joking. Uh, its eyes, Larson noted, uh, noticed, were wet looking. Their whites streaked with red blood vessels. Human eyes. It felt like they were staring at him. The clown girl laughed, turned around to face him. Then she was gone. Larson felt the floor upturned beneath him. It tilted so far that he started sliding backward. He struggled to find his balance. Once he got his footing and the floor beneath him felt level again, he looked around to see what uh, to see he was in a room, though an unfamiliar one. It was a small, modest living room, an ugly, fanned, handmade Af afghan was draped over the couch. What? Afghan? What's, what's that? Uh, on the coffee table was a glass about one-fourth full of milk and a saucer with cookie crumbs on it. Where was he? He looked around, trying to orient himself. The digital clock on the stove in the kitchen announced the time as 1.35am. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm so lost. I'm so lost. I'm so confused. I don't want to read this anymore because I'm so confused of what's happening. Wow. Okay, so... Eleanor's creating an illusion, right? And Eleanor's the bad guy in all of this, not the stitch wraith. I think Larson knows that. 1.35am? Why 1.35am? Okay, well... There was a sound, a frantic scratching, like there was an animal trapped behind the closed door of another room. It's obviously the Ella doll. A little apprehensively, Larson opened it to let out the cat or dog. But there was no cat or dog, and the scratching continued insistently from inside the room. Larson stood in the doorway and peeked inside. The scratching was coming from outside the window. Framed in the window was the clown-like face with the circle cheeks and red grin. She was staring at the window with her metal fingertips. In the bed, a young woman sat up clutch clutching her covers, her eyes wide with terror. Is that... Is that... um, uh, oh, What's her name? What's her name? Uh, from the from the 1.35am story. What is her name? Oh my god, I cannot believe I don't remember her name. As I said, my brain is kind of dead right now. Because I've read all of this in, like, the space of 24 hours, basically. Or, not 24 hours, 48 hours. Um, yeah. You need to get out of here, Larson said to the woman. You're in danger. She didn't look in his direction. Didn't seem able to see or hear him. Instead, she looked around frantically without stopping to rest her gaze on either Larson or the murderous creature in the window, muttering, It's the doll. It's the doll. The floor rose up again, the bedroom fell away, and Larson felt himself falling too. 
is is oh is Eleanor showing Larson basically all of her victims or something? Was was Ella? No, not Ella. Uh, Eleanor. Wait, wait, Ella, Eleanor. Very similar name. No, I'm joking. Actually, I wasn't joking, but they could be kind of similar. I think Eleanor was in charge of a lot of these stories. Was that was the bad guy behind a lot of these stories? Wow. Okay. If this is true. He was standing in the doorway of an operating room. Is this step closer? He was standing in the doorway of an operating room. Two men in surgical scrubs stood over a table on which a motionless young boy was strapped. His eyes were wide, were open wide and stayed open even after one of the surgeons tried to close them. Behind the boy's head, holding him down on the shoulders, was the smiling clown girl. One of the surgeons turned on a small buzz, saw... One of the surgeons turned on a small buzz, saw that word menacingly. Oh, buzz saw, sorry, buzz saw, word menacingly. Somehow Larson knew that this surgery wasn't going to save the boy. Instead, it was something the boy needed saving from. It was Eleanor who was putting him in danger. Larson burst into the room, prepared to save the boy if he could. But when Larson reached the operating table, the boy wasn't there. The surgeons were gone, and on the table was a man. Or what was left of a man. The boy appeared to have been burnt, almost beyond recognition, hairless, faceless, almost skinless, except for a translucent layer through which the pulsing of his organs were visible. This is either the man in room 1280 or a Fazgu creature, right? Uh, as Larson breathed in at the shocking sight, his nose filled with a sickly smell of charred flesh. Yeah, it, it's the man in room 1280. What am I all about? Sweet, meaty, and acrid, all at the same time. He retched and took a step back. As he tried to recover, Larson became aware of a sound, a rustling, a whisper, that seemed to be coming from the man's body. The, man li the man's lipless mouth did not move. The sound seemed to be coming from within his chest. Larson leaned down to listen right above the man's visible beating heart. Wait! What if... This is an insane theory right here. This could be the the worst theory in my life, but let me let me give me a second here. What if any child in any of these stories that has black curly hair is Eleanor? No, that's a stupid theory, isn't it? What I'm trying to say is there are a lot of curly black haired people. Right? And obviously people tie that to Cassidy, because Cassidy means long black curly hair or whatever. Uh, or no, I think it just means curly hair, but anyway. Oh, no, that, I, don't, I don't think that theory is true. I don't know. There's something going on here, and it's something big, and I think it's going to explain literally everything in, the, in this series. So I'm so super excited to read the rest of this. Um, uh... Where was I? I actually don't know where I was, so I'm just going to carry on. As he tried to recover, Larson became aware of a sound, a rustling, a whisper. That seemed to be coming from the man's body. The man's lipless mouth did not move. The sound seemed to be coming from within his chest. Larson leaned down to listen right above the man's visible beating heart. A pair of metal hands gripped Larson's shoulders, and a familiar face burst from the uh, burned man's body cavity. The pink cheek circles were made of the man's tissue. The mouth and teeth were red with blood. The strong metal hands dragged Larson inside the burnt, the burnt man's body. What is going on here? The strong metal hands... Okay. There was only darkness. He tried to feel what was around him, but only grasped air. There was a whooshing sound, and he was standing at the entrance of a maze lit by black light. It was clearly some kind of kid's game. There were colourful cutouts of buildings... Like a school and a firehouse. This is hide and seek, lads. But someone must have gotten rough with the game because some of the cutouts have been knocked down and patches were on the walls to repair damage. And there she was in the middle of the maze, like a minotaur, winking and giving a jaunty little wave before she took off at a run. So she was behind hide and seek? He chased her, but he was a man, not a machine. And he was physically and mentally exhausted. He wasn't sure how long he could keep up the chase. He made a left, then a right, then another right, trying to remember the directions in case he got lost and needed to backtrack. 
His eyes ached from the harshness of the black light. Oh my god. Larson made another right and ran into a boy. Well, the body of a boy. The boy was hanging from the wall with wooden pegs driven through his back. Clearly that's Toby. Uh, a puddle of blood had gathered on the floor below his sneakers. Larson felt he might be sick again. He turned his head from the upsetting sight and saw Eleanor leaning in the doorway, smiling as if she were looking on a happy scene. This is my dream, by the way. Every single story, like, gone through, but in the epilogue, discreetly. This, this is like a dream to me. For some reason, the dead boy was smiling too, as if he and the clown girl were sharing a private joke. Oh. The floor flipped up like a trapdoor. Larson fell hard and was surprised to feel grass and dirt beneath him. It was dark and the air was cool and breezy. Outside, he was outside. But where? He stood and tried to shake off his disorientation. He was standing a few feet away from a railroad track. A figure was visible, standing on the tracks. He moved closer. Wait, there were two figures. Is this, uh, is this out of stock? Or is this Blackbird? One was the... Wait, yeah. One was the horribly, horrible monstrosity he'd been chasing in whatever alternate reality or break with reality he was experiencing. The other, held in the arms of the first, was a kid in some kind of costume. What? This is crazy. This is the craziest epilogue. Eleanor spun him, so obviously this is Blackbird. Eleanor spun him around, uh, no doubt making him dizzy and disoriented. The kid struggled and fought, kicking his long legs. Was he dressed as a bird? But he was tangled in this costume and couldn't get himself free. In the distance, Larson heard the whistle of a train. He ran to the tracks. Eleanor turned her head and locked eyes with Larson. She let go of her victim, jumped up and took off across a nearby field. The kid in the strange bird costume was still on the tracks, tangled in his weird bird suit and disoriented. Larson pushed him off the tracks. He landed in a ditch but at least he wasn't in the path of the train. Larson waited while the train roared past, then started running across the field where Eleanor had headed, but soon it was apparent that it was too late. She was gone. Larson stood in the dark field, unsure of where he was or when it was. This is insane. What? Jake looked over at the creature he could only think of not Ronell, of as not Ronell. Hang on a second, hang on a second, not Ronell? That, is that a reference to sea bonnies? Oh my god, <laughs> oh my god. Uh, then he looked down at the body of the police officer he had once saved. The guy had just wandered into the house and passed out, hitting his head on the floor and whispering the name Eleanor. Too many weird things were happening all at once. Ronell! Wait, hang on, hang on. Hitting his head on the floor and whispering the name Eleanor. Too many with... Oh, right, yeah, okay. Uh, Ronell cried the same booming voice that had been called out when the front door had opened. Jake turned again and watched the bushy-haired man from the photo rush toward Ronell. Not Ronell. Dr. Talbot wrapped his arms around his fake daughter and squeezed her hard. Tears streamed down his lined face. I'm so happy you're home. I thought I'd lost you forever. The doctor was so focused on the girl in his arms that he didn't even look at Jake. But the girl did. Not Ronell looked directly at Jake, and she winked. Eleanor, Jake said. Eleanor grinned. The grin was even more triumphant than the wink. Jake didn't hesitate. He launched himself at Eleanor and knocked her back into a wall of shelves. As the metal contents of the shelves cascaded down on Jake and Eleanor, Jake thought about the last time he'd seen the thing that had pretended to be Ronell. The last time he'd seen her, she'd been freeing herself from the trash rabbit, she was in the thing, that it disappeared into the vent opening. Yes! Yeah! Yeah, she was! He could still hear her horrible cackle in his mind. Jake knew now that he'd been right. This thing, Eleanor, not the man named Afton, had been the thing powering the giant monster. Afton, while unimaginably evil, had been too weak at the time. Eleanor had given him his last burst of strength, but he failed, and she escaped, and now she'd tricked Jake into bringing her here for some reason. What did she want from him? Theory time! What if Ronell is a parallel to, or, or Eleanor is a parallel to Vanny? And she's trying to bring back Afton? That is an insane theory, I think. And it's clear here 
it's it's clear that the 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 villain of Fazbear Frights was from the second story in the entire series. It seemed like it seems like the first story into the pit was probably the most important story, and the second story was the second most important story with with the introduction of Eleanor, who is the main villain. This is a huge reveal if this is true. Oh my god. Wow. Whatever re whatever her reasons for bringing him here, they couldn't be good. Jake figured if he was if he attacked her before she saw it coming, he might be able to stop whatever it was she was planning. But he hadn't counted on how clever and manipulative she was. Jake had done nothing but knock Eleanor into the shelves. However, when she screamed and tore he away from him, she had a stab wound in her belly. It was ble bleeding heavily. Jake knew he hadn't stabbed Eleanor. He looked down and checked to be sure some part of him hadn't done it accidentally. He looked for sharp edges, for evidence that he had done damage. Nope, he had no blood on him at all. She'd done it to herself. And it had the effect Jake was sure she'd planned. Dr. Talbert cried out in rage, reached into the desk drawer and grabbed something Jake couldn't see. That something turned out to be a gun, as Jake discovered when Dr. Talbert fired three shots at him. What? So Dr. Talbert is bad, they're working together. Oh my god. Oh my god. So, okay, okay, okay. So, let's get it straight, let's simplify this. So, Dr. Talbert's daughter is supposedly Ronell, who is Eleanor, okay? Eleanor is against Jake because she's the main villain of all of this, right? Dr. Talbot, her dad, had been experimenting with Remnant, and now Dr. Talbot is against Jake. So, is Dr. Talbot a parallel to Afton, and Eleanor a parallel to Vanny, or something like that? Something like that, right? Because, how, why is Dr. Talbot bad? Oh my god, okay. Fired three shots at him. He, clearly he was trying to find out things about Remnant for a bad reason, right? Two of the shots pinged harmlessly off Jake's metal, but the third shot hit his endoskeleton's battery. Jake crumpled to the floor, the energy sucked out of him. As soon as Jake was down, Dr. Talbert rushed to his daughter. Oh, there we go. His daughter. I'll be right back, Ronell, he said. He left the room and quickly reappeared, pushing a rolling metal table. He picked her up effortlessly and laid her on it. Hang on, Ronell, he said. I can save you. Remnant will save you. Jake couldn't move, but he could hear and see. He wanted with all his will to say, that's not your daughter, but he couldn't speak. As soon as Dr. Talbert said, Remnant, Eleanor smiled. She wanted Remnant. That's why, that was why she had tricked Jake into being her here, into bringing her here. But what was Remnant? And why did she want it? No! I know what's going to happen. Dr. Talbot is going to take Jake's remnant from the Stitch Wraith and put it in Eleanor? No, actually no, that makes no sense. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But what was remnant and why did she want it? Flashes of the memories he felt when he was near her gave him glimpses into its nature. He couldn't hear her thoughts exactly, but he could feel the words. Power. Life. Eternal. Oh, okay. V very nice words there. Uh, the doctor put a pillow under he Eleanor's head and said, Just relax. I'll be right back. He ran from the room, then returned with a mo rolling metal tray containing beakers of bubbling. Thick silver liquid. That's remnant. He pulled the tray up to next to the table. While Eleanor looked at the liquid and smiled wildly. Uh, widely, sorry. Dr. Talbot took out his phone and punched in a number. Security? I've had a break-in. Thank you. Yes, now. Dr. Talbot glanced at Jake. He hadn't seemed to notice the unconscious man on the floor. Eleanor gazed at the bubbling liquid as if it were the most precious thing in the world. Jake couldn't move. All he could do was watch Dr. Talbot begin hooking up tubing to the containers of the liquid substance. Dr. Talbot glanced at Jake one more time. Then he prepared an IV to transfer the liquid into the thing he thought was his daughter. Jake tried to will himself to move, but will without physical power was useless. The detective's eyelids fluttered and he mumbled something incoherent. 
but he did not regain consciousness. Eleanor locked eyes with Jake. She was still smiling. Of course she's smiling, Jake thought. She won. Something was changing. Eleanor's human disguise was disintegrating. The dark, curly hair fell from her scalp, but disappeared before it hit the floor. The healthy-looking pink tin... Wait, pink tinged flesh on her face melted away to reveal a thin layer of sickly grey skin. Dr. Talbot drew back in horror. Eleanor's huge, dead eyes bulged and her red-stained mouth gaped, revealing the vicious zigzag of her teeth. She looked at Jake, her eyes pulsating, her unhinged jaw opening wide. Oh, I don't want that to be it. I don't want that to be the last line. Oh. So right now, we've got the villains, Eleanor primarily and Dr. Talbert, who is infusing her with Remnant or something, so that she can be stronger, I assume. She can be immortal. I don't know. Um, and next to them, laying on the floor, is Larson, who is in an illusion, and is just in the middle of the field somewhere, when he's actually just lying down unconscious uh, on the floor next to Eleanor. And, of course, Jake, who whose battery is out, basically, and can't move, but can hear and see everything. Wow. Okay. I just want to say, that epilogue was the best thing that I have ever read out of these books. I'm not even kidding, okay? My favourite stories before this were The Real Jake and In the Flesh, mainly. Um, they were written exquisitely. All of the stories are written so well. But the fact that in this one, we got a crossover between, like, literally, like, 20 stories. The fact that we got that crossover is incredible to me and it makes me feel like in the last epilogue the next and the last epilogue we're gonna get everything revealed okay and everything is gonna connect it's gonna be very nice we're gonna find out what Eleanor's true motive is and we're gonna find out how Eleanor pulled this off if she is the one behind a lot of these Fazbear Fright stories anyway this has given me something to work on. Uh, I am really intrigued now. I kind of just want to read all of the stories again and see if I can spot anything out of place. Um, I mean, hmm, I don't know. I don't know, I'm really curious now. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching and I will see you in possibly an analysis video of this epilogue. So I'll see you later, goodbye.